Welcome back to the series on recursion. In this part, we'll cover general strategies for writing recursive functions. In general, every recursive function has three parts. You have a base case or base condition after which the recursion should stop. Without this, you would have an unbounded recursion and it might result in an infinite loop. Second, each recursive call must make some progress towards the base case. Again, if you don't make such progress, you may have an unbounded recursion. Finally, you may have some corner cases to deal with separately, such as invalid or out-of-bounds values. These three elements may seem familiar. In fact, these are the same basic elements of a loop, an initialization, a continuation condition, and an increment towards that terminating condition. In this case, the initialization can be thought of as the very first call to a recursive function, or the entry point of a recursion. Designing a recursive solution for your problem requires you to think about a general case. Again, similar to loops, you have to think about what to do at the ith iteration of your function. Given the input, how do you divide the problem up into subproblems, and or how do you combine the recursive results to conquer and solve the problem? Generally, this is a form of mathematical induction or inductive reasoning that requires careful abstract thought. Instead of giving a step-by-step -step process, which is not really even possible for every single problem, we'll get used to this idea by going through several examples. First, we'll write a recursive function to compute the Fibonacci sequence. This is a cliched example, but used in almost every introduction to recursion. Generally, I dislike this example, but it'll prove useful later on when we cover why you might want to avoid recursion in general. Thus, it provides a very good bad example. Next, we'll write a recursive function to find the largest element in an array of integers, simulating a traditional loop. Unlike our first example, this will actually solve a problem instead of just counting down to blast off. Finally, we'll design a divide and conquer style function that sums elements of an array of integers to show the real power of recursive thinking. First, let's write that function for the Fibonacci sequence. It takes an integer n and returns the nth Fibonacci number. The first thing we need to do is make sure that we take care of our base cases. When n is 1 or n is 2, the first two Fibonacci numbers will return 1. Otherwise, we need to compute the previous Fibonacci number as well as the second previous Fibonacci number. That's the previous one. and that's the second previous one. We return their sum. Let's go ahead and test this. There's the 10th Fibonacci number that we had previously looked at, 55. Let's test it for other values. Seems right. Let's test one more. The 12th Fibonacci number should be the sum of 55 and 89, so we'd expect 144. Now, what about corner cases? What about negative one? This is undefined with respect to the Fibonacci number, but it also has some terrible consequences for our program. A segmentation fault. We weren't doing any pointers or memory manipulation here. Something else was going on that we'll revisit later on. For now, let's go ahead and add in some code to take care of corner cases. Any value less than one will return a flag value, negative one. Now at least it doesn't result in a segmentation fault. Now let's go ahead and do the second exercise. 
we'll recursively compute the largest element in an array. We'll of course need the array. But let's also go ahead and take an index. Now the idea here is that we're going to kind of simulate the countdown that we had before. We'll start at the end of the array, compare the current largest element that we found so far to the element stored at index. And if it's larger, then we'll keep track of that somehow. But when we get down to the end of the array, say a negative index, then we'll want to stop and return what we found so far. To see what I mean, before we actually write this function, let's figure out how we actually want to call this function. We'll start at the end of the array, at index 7. Then we'll count down, looking at index 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, etc. Let's go ahead and change it so that it's not necessarily the last element. The first thing we need to do is figure out our base case. If we're counting down, then that means that we should be done when the index becomes negative. Now this is not real code here. How do we keep track of the largest element? We'll come back to this. Here we want to see if the element stored at the current index is greater than the largest element that we found so far. If the element that we're currently considering is larger, then we want to update that largest element. If not, we want to recursively call the largest element function on index minus one with the old largest element. We should be able to do the second one easily, assuming that the largest element is stored in a variable called largest. How do we communicate that variable to the function though? Let's go ahead and add one more parameter. In the second block, we simply pass it along. But in the first block, instead of passing the largest, we'll pass array of index. Now let's address our base case. Since we're now passing in the current largest that we found so far, I'll simply return it because there's nothing else to compare it to. This necessarily changes how we're going to call this function initially. Instead of starting at the last element, we'll start at the second to last element and initialize that very first call's largest value to the last element in the array. Now let's test it out. Seems to work. We were able to iterate over an array as well as communicate additional information to each function call without using a loop control structure. Now let's do the third problem. Given an array, we'll want to recursively sum up its elements. Before we start coding, let's go ahead and whiteboard this a little bit. Here I've got an array of eight elements. A divide and conquer approach could be done as follows. We'll go ahead and split it up into two equally sized arrays, the first half and the second half. Then we'll split it up further. Each of the arrays of size four will be split up into arrays of size two. We'll go ahead and split it one more time so that we have an array of size one. This is going to be our base case. When we have an array of size one, there's no sum to be computed. 
It's just simply that value. We'll return 5 and 9 and sum them up so that we get 14. We'll continue returning the sum of values all the way up to the original function call. Let's go ahead and start writing it. First I'll need the array. Now I'm not going to actually break up the array into subarrays. All I have to do to break it up is essentially keep track of a left index and a right index. Initially for an array of size eight, that will be zero and seven. Then as we recurse, we'll go ahead and pass in different values for the left and right that refer to a part of the subarray. I'll pass in L and R for left and right indices. Now what about our base case here? So the left index is always going to be less than or equal to the right index. When they're equal, then we've got an array of size one. So that's our first base case. Once we have an array of size one, we simply return the value of the element at that index. Otherwise, we need to split the array up into two parts, a left part and a right part. To do that, I need to compute the middle index. Now, in general, this is a bad solution because of the risk of overflow, but for this toy example, it'll be okay. Now we've got the left index, the middle index, and the right index. Note that we've also relied on truncation to take care of the case when it's not evenly divisible. So we need to make two recursive calls here. On the left partition, the array is unchanged. The left index stays where it is, but then we'll pass in the middle index. For the right partition, we pass in the array. We don't pass in the middle index for the left part. Instead, we go up by one. Otherwise, we'd be double counting that middle element. The right index stays the same though. Now, before we test this, we could add in one more base case here. If our left index ever exceeds our right index, something has gone seriously wrong. In any case, that's going to be an empty subarray, and so we'll return zero because the sum of an empty array is zero. Here I've got the same array as in our example. The left index will start at zero. The right index starts at seven. And it works. This solution is similar to what you might do on a piece of paper when you have to add up a large number of sums. You simply group them up into smaller groups of numbers so that you don't have to keep too many numbers in your head. A lot of divide and conquer strategies and algorithms have this kind of flavor.